In the second part of this sermon against adultery, you have learned how earnestly the scripture warns us to avoid the sin of adultery and to embrace cleanness of life. We saw that through adultery, we fall into all kinds of sins and are made bondservants of the devil. But through cleanness of life, we live as members of Christ. And finally, we heard how far adultery takes someone away from goodness and drives them headlong into all vices, mischief and misery. Now, I will declare to you what grievous punishments God in times past plagued adultery with and how certain secular rulers also punished it. By this, you will perceive that sexual immorality and fornication are sins which are detestable in the sight of God and all good people, as I've been saying. In the first book of Moses, we read that when mankind began to be multiplied on the earth, the men and women gave their minds so greatly to fleshly delights and impure pleasure that they lived without any fear of God. God, seeing this carnal and abominable living and perceiving that they did not amend their lives, but rather increased more and more daily in their sinful and unclean lifestyles, repented that he had ever made them. And to show how greatly he abhorred adultery, sexual immorality, fornication and all uncleanness, he made all the foundations of the deep earth burst out and the floodgates of heaven opened so that rain came down on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. By this means, he destroyed the whole world and all mankind except eight people. Noah, the preacher of righteousness, as St. Peter calls him, his wife, his three sons and their wives. What a grievous judgment God sent here on all living creatures for the sin of sexual immorality. Because of this, God took vengeance not only on mankind, but also on birds, beasts and on all living creatures. Murder had been committed before, but the world hadn't been destroyed for that. But for sexual immorality, the world, apart from a few, was overwhelmed with water and so perished. An example worthy to be remembered so that you may learn to fear God. Again, we read that for the filthy sin of uncleanness, Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities near to them were destroyed with fire and brimstone from heaven so that there was neither man, woman, child or beast there left alive, nor anything that grew on the earth. Whose heart does not tremble at the hearing of this history? Who is so drowned in sexual immorality and uncleanness that they will not now and forever leave this abominable lifestyle, seeing that God destroys and grievously punishes uncleanness? to rain fire and brimstone from heaven, to destroy whole cities, to kill man, woman and child and all other living creatures who lived there, to consume with fire all that ever grew. What can be more manifest tokens of God's wrath and vengeance against uncleanness and impurity of life? Mark this history, good people, and fear the vengeance of God. Do we not also read that God struck Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of his ungodly desire for Sarai, the wife of Abraham? Likewise, we read of Abimelech, king of Gerar, although he didn't touch or sleep with her. God cast these plagues and punishments on impure and unclean people before the law was given to declare how great his love for marriage is, the law of nature alone reigning in the hearts of humanity. The law would later declare how much he abhors adultery, fornication and all uncleanness. 
And when the law forbade all sexual sin uh, that was given by the law given by Moses to the Jews, didn't God command that those who broke it should be put to death? The words of the law are these. Whoever commits adultery with another man's wife shall be put to death, both the man and the woman, because they have broken the bond of marriage. In the law, it is also commanded that a woman and a man caught together in sexual sin should be stoned to death. In another place, we also read that God commanded Moses to take all the chiefs and leaders of the people and to hang them on gallows openly so that everyone could see them because they committed or did not punish sexual immorality. And again, didn't God send such a plague among the people for fornication and uncleanness that 23,000 died in one day? I pass over, for lack of time, many other histories in the Holy Bible which declare the grievous vengeance and heavy displeasure of God against the sexually immoral and adulterers. Certainly, this extreme punishment appointed by God evidently shows how greatly God hates sexual immorality. So let us not doubt that God at this present time abhors all manner of uncleanness no less than he did under the old law and will undoubtedly punish it both in this world and in the world to come. For he is a God who can abide no wickedness. Therefore, all who care for the glory of God and the salvation of their souls should avoid it. St Paul says, all these things are written for our example and to teach us the fear of God and obedience to his holy law. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare us who are only grafted on if we commit such offences. If God destroyed many thousands of people, many cities, indeed the whole world because of sexual immorality, let us not flatter ourselves and think that we should escape and be free without punishment. For he has promised in his holy law to send most grievous plagues on those who transgress his holy commandments. Thus we have heard how God punishes the sin of adultery. Let us now hear about certain laws which the civil magistrates devised in various countries for the punishment of it. Then we will learn how uncleanness has always been detested in well-ordered cities and commonwealths and among all honest persons. The law among the Lepreans was this, that when anyone was caught in adultery, they were bound and carried for three days through the city and afterwards, as long as they lived, they were despised and with shame considered as people without any honesty. Among the Locrians, adulterers had both of their eyes thrust out. The Romans in times past punished sexual immorality, sometimes by fire, sometimes by sword. If a man among the Egyptians was taken in adultery, the law was that he should openly, in the presence of all the people, be whipped naked a thousand times. The woman that was caught with him had her nose cut off and so was always identified as an adulteress and therefore to be abhorred by all. Among the Arabians, those who were caught in adultery had their heads cut off. The Athenians punished sexual immorality by death in a similar way. So likewise did the barbarous Tartars. Among the Turks, even today, those caught in adultery, both man and woman, were stoned to death straight away without mercy. Thus we see what godly laws were devised in times past by the authorities for putting away sexual immorality and for maintaining holy marriage and pure relationships. And the authors of these laws were not Christians but heathens. 
Yet they were so inflamed with the love of honesty and purity of life that for the maintenance and conservation of it, they made godly statutes, allowing neither fornication nor adultery to reign in their realms unpunished. Christ said to the people, the people of Nineveh will rise at the judgment with this nation, meaning the unfaithful Jews, and shall condemn them. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. But behold, he said, one greater than Jonah is here, meaning himself, and yet you do not repent. So don't you think that in the same way the Locrians, Arabians, Athenians and others will rise up at the day of judgment and condemn us? They ceased their sexual immorality at human command, and we have the law and clear precepts and commandments of God, and yet we do not forsake our impure lifestyles. Truly, truly, it shall be easier on the day of judgment for those heathen people than for us, unless we repent and change. Although physical death seems to us a grievous punishment in this world for sexual immorality, yet that pain is nothing in comparison to the grievous torments which adulterers, fornicators and all unclean persons shall suffer after this life. For all such people shall be excluded and shut out from the kingdom of heaven. As St Paul says, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And St. John, in his revelation, says that the sexually immoral shall have their part with murderers, sorcerers, enchanters, liars, idolaters, and such others in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The punishment of the body, although it is death, has an end. But the punishment of the soul, which St John calls the second death, is everlasting. There shall be fire and brimstone, weeping and gnashing of teeth, and the worm which there gnaws the conscience of the damned shall never die whose heart does not distill even drops of blood to hear and consider such things. If we tremble and shake at the hearing and naming of these pains, oh, what shall those who feel them do when they suffer them and suffer them forever? God, have mercy on us. Who is now so drowned in sin and past all godliness that they will be more concerned for an impure pleasure which soon passes away than by the loss of everlasting glory? Again, who will so give themselves to the lusts of the flesh that they do not fear the pains of hell fire at all? But now let us hear how we may avoid the sin of sexual immorality so we may walk in the fear of God and be free from those most grievous and intolerable torments which afflict all unclean persons. To avoid fornication, adultery and all uncleanness, let us ensure that above all things we keep our hearts pure and clean from all evil thoughts and carnal lusts. For if our heart is so infected and corrupted, we fall headlong into all kinds of ungodliness. This we shall easily do if, when we feel inwardly that Satan, our old enemy, tempts us to sexual immorality, we by no means consent to his crafty suggestions, but valiantly resist and withstand him by strong faith in the word of God. We must always bring against him in our hearts this commandment of God. 
scriptum est non moicabaris. It is written, you shall not commit sexual sin. It would be good also for us to always live in the fear of God and to set before our eyes the grievous threatenings of God against all ungodly sinners. And we should consider in our minds how impure, carnal and brief that pleasure is to which Satan moves us. And again, how the pain appointed as punishment for that sin is intolerable and everlasting. Moreover, we must be moderate and sober in eating and drinking. Avoid unclean conversation. Avoid all immoral company. Flee idleness. Delight in reading Holy Scripture and watch in godly prayers and virtuous meditations. And at all times, to endure godly trials shall help greatly in the avoidance of sexual sins. Here are all sorts of people to be admonished, whether they're married or unmarried, to love chastity and cleanness of life. For the married are bound by the law of God so purely to love one another that neither of them seek any other love. The man must only join to his wife and the wife only to her husband. They must so delight in one another's company that neither of them covet any other. And as they are bound to live together like this in all godliness and honesty, so likewise is it their duty to bring up their children that they do not fall into Satan's snare or into any uncleanness, but that they may come pure and honest to holy marriage in due time. So likewise ought all masters and rulers to provide that no sexual immorality of any kind or of uncleanness is indulged in by their servants. And again, those who are single and feel in themselves that they cannot live without the company of a spouse, let them marry and so live together in a godly way. For it is better to marry than to burn. And to avoid fornication, the apostle says each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. Finally, all who feel in themselves a sufficiency and ability through the operation of God's spirit to lead a single and self-controlled life, let them praise God for this gift and seek by all means possible to maintain this by reading holy scriptures, by godly meditations, by continual prayers and other such virtuous exercises. If we all endeavour to behave in this way, to avoid fornication, adultery and all uncleanness and lead our lives in all godliness and honesty, serving God with a pure and clean heart and glorifying him in our bodies by leading an innocent life. We may be sure to be in the number of those of whom our Saviour Christ speaks in the gospel thus. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, to whom alone be all glory, honour, rule and power forever and ever. Amen.